How many of you have traditions or rituals? You probably don't think of it in that way, but how many of you have traditions or rituals around mealtime? Actually, if we thought of it, if you thought about it for a minute, everybody's hand should actually go up. I know it's harder for some of us that have, and I say younger children, you know, high school age kids, you know, it's, you like to sit down at the table as a family and eat a family meal together, and how often is that possible in today's day when even the little kids have schedules where they're running all over the place and it's hard to get people together. But when you do sit down at the table together as a family, is there a place that everybody sits? All right, you know, and if somebody sits in somebody else's seat, that causes a problem, doesn't it? Or if you have a friend over, right? If you have kids and you have a friend over and they sit in somebody's seat. Oh my gosh. It's like the end of the world, right? Do you have a set prayer that you pray? Do you have one person that always prays? These are rituals. These are traditions. Whether or not you look at them that way, but these are the way that things happen. And think about big meals for a moment. Think about Thanksgiving and Easter and Christmas when you gather with family and extended family, right? I'm still at the little kids' table with my family, <laughs> right? And there's somebody that always prays, right? Grandpa, Grandma, somebody always prays. And who always gets to eat first? Yeah, see, there's somebody, right? There's somebody that you know that if you get in line before they do, there's going to be problems. And you don't buck the system. But is there always enough food? Of course. And there's leftovers. Right? A story we heard a couple of weeks ago. Jesus fed 5,000 people. And how much was left? How much? How many baskets? Twelve. There was twelve baskets left over of bread and fish, mostly of bread. And we'll get to an interesting thing here a little bit later about bread in the Gospel of Mark and, and some other meaning that it might have. But there's leftovers. There's always enough for everybody to have their fill and then some more, and there's still stuff left over. Which brings us to our story today. Of Jesus calling a woman a dog. Does anybody else just find this a little odd, a little weird? I've been reading a lot of stuff this past week about hoping that pastors are not going to be in pulpits this morning preaching that Jesus is a racist. Because um, it'd be real easy to do that this morning from our text. Because um, that's what it is. It's all about Syrophoenician. It's all about the Gentiles. It's all about the fact that they were different than the race that was called to be God's people. And that's not what this text is about. I'd be the first to say that right here. Is it easy for us to understand why Jesus calls this woman a dog? No. Because there's really two reasons why this could happen. One is that he knows what she's already going to say, which is possibly true, but means that God is really then controlling everything. And then we have to get into the fact of why does God let bad things happen to good people? Right? That's not an easy road to go down. Okay, so then there's the next road of Jesus is actually human and holding up the Jewish understanding that Syrophoenician people are less human than, than the Jews are. Which then shows that Jesus is really human, but also does not play into his divinity at that point in time. So both of those ways that we can look at this text have, air, have, have reasons for us to doubt and, and questions that just arise that are way too hard for us to deal with in the next five minutes. It's not an easy text to look at. Because here we have Jesus who just fed 5,000 people out on a, on a hillside and had baskets left over, abundance of grace in a place where there wasn't anything to have. The disciple came to Jesus and said, how are we going to feed all these people out here in the wilderness? How are we going to give them bread into this, in this wild place where there is none? How are we going to do that? And then he comes into the town of Tyre and he calls this woman a dog because she's not like him. Which is interesting because, number one, there's some, some things we have to understand here. Um, he is in public 
and she is a woman, which we all say, big deal, it's 2015, she's a woman, she's allowed to talk, she can vote, right? This kind of, I was reading through some history of this congregation just this past week because of some things that popped up in this congregation. St. John's voted way, way back before anybody else ever thought about doing it that their women would be allowed to vote. Rebels. Stepping out there and saying everybody is equal in this, right? Because she's a woman, she's not allowed to talk. I have a quote for you from a book called Jerusalem in the Time of Christ. It says, A woman was expected to remain unobserved in public. There, was, there is a record saying of one of the oldest scribes that we know, Jose Johanan of Jerusalem. It comes from about 150 B.C. Talk not much with womankind, to which was added, they said this of a man's own wife. How much more of his fellow's wife? Rules of property forbade a man to be alone with a woman, to look at a married woman, or even to give her a greeting. It was disgraceful for a scholar to speak with a woman in the street, and a woman who conversed with anyone in the street could be divorced without the payment prescribed in the marriage settlement. Women were to be seen, if seen at all, and never heard in public. So right there, this woman now has two strikes against her. Not only is she Syrophoenician, a Gentile, but she's in public talking to Jesus. She's broken societal norms and done things that seem completely out of line or are completely out of line. But let me ask you a question. If you knew that Jesus was here in town and that your child was ill, what would you not do to go see that man to make sure that the miracles that he was doing to others would be done to your child? What would you not do? I would break every societal or known to man if that shocks anybody to go and see Jesus to make sure that my child was taken care of. Because that's what we do. But it leads us to an understanding of what is it that we do here that is only because we don't want to ruffle the waves or scatter feathers make people get upset? What is it that we do because it's safe to do that and not something else that we know Jesus is calling us to? Who is it that we're not inviting to this place? Because they may stick out. If that's the case, you just tell them to look at a picture of me and they're not going to be any more weird than I am. So... But who is it that we're not inviting? Because everybody can use God's grace. Everybody can use God's love. Everybody can use mercy. Because here's the thing that we don't see about this Syrophoenician woman. We all think, or our understanding, or our perception of her is that she is someone who is lacking in money. Or at least that was my thought, I guess I should say. Not project my thoughts on you. But every time I've read this text, I've always thought that this woman was a woman who was in need. Not to say that she didn't have stuff, but she didn't have everything that she needed. But the text tells us something different. I noticed that this week from things that I read and, and looked into. Right? She says to Jesus that even the dogs under the table get to eat the scraps. That means that she had a table tall enough that a dog could fit under it. And then it says, when she left, she went home and she found her daughter lying on the bed. Not a mat, not a cot. She had a bed. That means that she's well off. She's not poor in any sense, in any stretch of the imagination. She's got a table tall enough that dogs can be under it, or at least has been around that, and her daughter is able to lie on a bed and not a mat or a cot, something on the floor. So she is well-to-do, but she's still coming to Jesus. Because that's, she knows that Jesus can help her. She knows that Jesus can heal her daughter. 
And is that why we're here? Because we know that Jesus can heal us? Because we know that Jesus can give us something? Because we're moved to the fact that God has given up everything for us to bring us to this place? I heard something this morning in James as as Nancy read it to us. Mercy is better than judgment. Mercy is better than judgment. You see, each and every one of us here is very well off. And, and, and I say that knowing who's in the audience, knowing who's here this morning. But in the whole grand scheme of the world, we're all very rich. And how do we use all of our resources to show forth God's mercy? I have one more quote for us this morning. From the book Behind the Stained Glass Windows, Money Dynamics in the Church. And the quote is, In reality, we find a definite prejudice in the church against talking about money as a spiritual concept, about its discipleship aspects, its lifestyle implications, and the church members' own individual giving patterns. As John C. Hughey has written, It's not like faith to be silent, but in the presence of money it has learned to accept a monologue, Thus, a finance committee meeting could consist of three hours of talk about balancing the budget and yet entirely avoid the topic of whether good church members are authentically responding to God's grace in their lives through their giving patterns. You see, if God is actually moving and in our lives like He is in the Syrophoenician woman, you're going to break all bounds and it's going to show through in everything that you do. At last week's meeting, I made a comment about how it takes 17 givers to make up one good giver. And I was questioned about that afterwards, asking what I actually meant by one good giver. My, my answer to that question was at least $100 a month, if not more. And some of you are looking at me like, I don't know if I can do that. And you know what? A good giver is someone who gives consistently. Last week I said if you put $5 in the plate and go out and spend $50 on lunch each week, that's not a good giver. We're tipping God. Has God moved us to the fact that we're willing to break all societal norms, that we're willing to go the distance to be with Him and show that forth in everything that we have and everything that we do? I actually did some research after my conversation with that member last week and I found out that the top 20% actually carried it. Let me me set this straight. I did no research. I asked Carrie to look into it for me. She gave me a piece of paper. Therefore, I did research on it. She did all the work. I did research on it. Carrie brought me the numbers that said the top 20% of our givers give on average $250, $260 a week. The top 20% of givers in this congregation give on average $260 a week. I see some really big eyes. I'm not asking you to give that. What I am asking you to do is think about what God has blessed you with. Because here's the whole thing to this text this morning of Jesus calling this woman a dog and healing her daughter and then going on to set a blind man free or a deaf man free and giving him his hearing back and his speech back is that even the crumbs that fall from the table and this is the table we're talking about now this table right here Even the crumbs that fall from the table are good enough for the dogs and therefore good enough for us. Because you know what? Each and every one of us in this room is in the same place as the Syrophoenician woman. Because I don't think any of us are of Jewish descendants yet. So none of us belong to the people of God. Except through the fact that God has given us His grace and has given us the crumbs that fall from the table. And in the Gospel of Mark, all except for one verse, when it talks about bread, you can substitute the word grace in there. And it makes just as much, if not more, sense. Because there's just enough in the grace crumbs that fall from this table to make even a sinner like me acceptable to come to this table and eat. To make even a sinner like you acceptable to come to this table and eat. So God has richly blessed us with an abundance. So what are we going to do with it? Because faith without works is dead. We 
are the ones who are blessed by God with more than just crumbs. So we need to come and show through all of the actions of our lives how much God has richly blessed us so that others can see that and be brought to this table too so that they can join us in eating crumbs.